Welcome to Lola and the Poets, a podcast on the magical reel. everybody to the 13th episode of Lola and the Poets podcast. My name is Milana. I shall be your host. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to listen to him over the radio. And unless he says something that's, well, that's sensational, it's just no good. And today we are welcoming a very interesting person. His name is Ewald von Rhein, and he's an artist, a scholar. He's from The Hague. He works at the Royal Academy of Art in the Netherlands. He has an interest in the connection between the arts and the esoteric or the occult. We'll talk about the definitions. So welcome to the episode. Well, thank you, Milana. Um, Glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. We had a little pre-chat before the show. Just very shortly, we're talking about the various things that can happen if you're rushing to something that's important to do and then you forget the most important thing. What would you say um, would be uh, the most important thing that you're working on now? At the moment, uh, I'm working on a series of uh, drawings and etchings, uh, which uh, after a few um, changes uh, was happening under the working title uh, Osiris's Orchids. Yeah, that's slowly progressing. Did a a double one last week uh, that came out nicely and um, intending to make a larger drawing now and then uh, some larger etching. So I'm kind of trying to scale up and it's kind of coming back to um, a series of work that I did during uh, the COVID uh, period. Yes. um, Which was titled, a series titled uh, Maldorers Militants, Maldorers uh, Militants, and I found a way of working in there uh, in printmaking, uh, layering colors um, that uh, that came out really interesting, and I'm trying to, uh, yeah, to to continue that and uh, to elaborate on it further, and see where uh, where I can take it further. What is the connection in your own work uh, between what you do? and inspirations or invocations or connections that you would have with the worlds that we would, let's say, define as magical. Where did it come from? How did it come to be? When you started your work as an artist, did it exist then? Or was it something that you introduced into your work later on? What existed, uh, the connection... um Yes, did, 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 this is, was magic. something that always interested you and was um, it inspired you to um, to be an artist because mm-hmm. that sometimes happens as well with people. Well, my, my really my earliest, um, you know, forays in, in, uh, in art or in drawing really came out of my interest in, uh, in, in, in comics. I, um, yeah. I came, I came through art, uh, through, through comics really. And, uh, com- reading comics have been, um, you know, a huge influence and, and kind of looking at comics at the, the artwork of comics have been a huge influence, formative influence. And it's still there. I think at some point my mom, uh, she was really um, 
you know, supporting us uh, kids, um, you know, in our uh, creativity. She was always do, uh, making sure we uh, we could do, uh, you know, work with clay. She did her, she did pottery herself, and um, you know, her dad was. Um, a house painter who uh, who painted um, oil paintings and drawings and uh, um, so she found it important and um, yeah uh, we were from a very Catholic uh, you know quite conservative Catholic uh, household but um, this was also important and and um, we had we had what what was called uh, in the in the Netherlands uh, society and and um, politics of the time. Uh, something that uh, was called a column. Uh, there were different columns um, supporting society, and one of them was the Catholic column, so to speak. And they re- really kept to themselves. So they had um, also like um, uh, publishers, Catholic publishers, and my uh, my Today, parents were. Subs- sorry to interrupt. Today we would call it the Catholic world. So it's like the um, yeah. yeah yeah yeah. But uh, yeah, in the Netherlands, they, they're kind of marginal, you know, although um, quite present at the same time politically. Um, and um, so they had a publishing house and uh, they, my parents subscribed to whatever the publishing publisher brought out. And they had this uh, large series of uh, the, the classics of painting. Uh, so that was kind of, um, how would you call it, this encycl- encyclopedic uh, collection of, uh, of 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 painters, you know, uh, Rembrandt, uh, Van Gogh. Uh, uh, you. you share a surname. Sorry. <laughs> I want to tell you, you share you share a surname with Rembrandt. So um, any relation? <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> Yeah, no. Um, my family is from, uh, you know, the, 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 this Rhine uh, River runs uh, all through uh, the country of the Netherlands, kind of cuts it in half. And um, uh, where it ends in the North Sea, um, it's a place called Katwijk, and that's where my family uh, is from. And the, 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 the Rembrandt family is one station earlier. It's uh, it's Leiden. So uh, no no family, although we kind of uh, had a joke about that in the family. The, the, so, so the series, uh, you know, I, I'm, I was looking into those books uh, a lot and I, I was like in awe of that all the that painting and, and and the possibilities of it and so initially I um, I really wanted to be a painter but I was doing uh, comics at the same time so I went I just um, had the chance to go to art school uh, thinking I was going to be a painter of course um, we met online um, and that's how we we connected so we don't really know much about what one each of like I know a little bit about you because I read up um, leading towards the interview and also we are uh, friends on Facebook so I know your work through that and I follow your work uh, but um, I um, I was also very very much into comics and I think we are huh? pretty much the same generation aren't we yeah. so we're Gen yeah. X yeah yeah <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah 57 this year I am yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, 19, I'm 1969. Is um, my, I was born in 1969, and I do know a little bit about like when I was growing up, very, very early on, I was very much into Tintin. So ah. Tintin was my first foray into into um, comics, but also Marvel comics. So I recently found like a bunch of comics um, from the I was I lived in Iran and I went to American school and that's a whole different thing so different civilizations but I had um, the experience of actually being able to get quite a lot of comics from America from that kind of end so I just saw like the bunch of things that I was reading as a kid and I was thinking my god this is just simply crazy for a young kid to to actually read this because these are some very very out there stories um yeah yeah. um i was i remember one particular one that really had this effect on me was called the witching hour Mm -hmm. and there was these three witches in like three stories with three witches and different kinds of enchantments and it was very precise when i you know when i came back to it from my vista now um, of various and they're turning people into stone, you know, for instance, mm-hmm. um, you know, and the, the whole golem thing. And so mm. 
what were your inspirations in the comics world? What was it that was your thing? Mm, mainly, uh, I started out with um, uh, Blueberry uh, by uh, Charlier and Giro, and, and uh, the guy who drew it is later uh, better known as a Mobius. Yeah. Um, but he started out as a studio artist uh, doing uh, this cowboy, uh, you know, it's actually not exactly a cowboy strip, but uh, it, it's it's in America. And um, uh, yeah, I really like that. I collected that. I, 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 every every Saturday I washed the car uh, of someone and then I ran to the shop and uh, bought uh, the, uh, the blueberry uh, in the series, the next one up. And uh, at the time, uh, there was also uh, really a renaissance of comics in the Netherlands, um, of which uh, Dick Matena or Dick Matena was a very interesting uh, person to be part of that. Uh, and he uh, later drew, uh, you know, he drew for uh, more underground comic um magazines like Metal Hurlant and um, Heavy Metal and uh, yeah it's it's pretty um, heavy stuff uh, most of it's uh, um, really dystopian um, science fiction stories mm -hmm. uh, and then later on he started drawing uh, classics of, uh, of Dutch uh, literature he's an amazing draftsman he still lives and yeah he was very uh, big influence and also the DC comics uh, were important to me like Batman and Spider-Man yeah. and I, I really remember um, one uh, Spider-Man that was issued like a special edition Spider-Man uh, that was drawn by uh, an artist called Bernie Wrightson and uh, that was a very uh, esoteric occult uh, type of um, story. Yeah. I wanted to ask you before that, before the actual connection of uh, comics and the occult, which is, I think, a brilliant thing to bring into this story because it is so prevalent. Did you ever get to read uh, Alan Ford? Um, it's an Italian comic. It was very big in ex-Yugoslavia, but I'm not quite sure was it also that popular, of course, in Italy as well, um, if, that, if it was that popular in the rest of Europe. It? it was Max Bonker and Magnus. It was, um, I think it started like late 60s and 70s, but we hmm. we were, I was reading it in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't know. It's an, actually, I recently talked with a friend of mine who was also, who's Italian and who kind of revealed to me the Italian um, uh, scene uh, of his uh, time. And, but that was all, all pretty new to me. So, no, I don't, I don't this, uh, know this. Uh, I think that it was, it was for some you know, strange reason, um, it was not that wildly known or it was super popular next to Yugoslavia. It had extreme black humor. Uh -huh. uh, and it was premise was that there was this um, group of uh, secret agents in New York, but they were completely clueless and uh -huh. but, you know, somehow managed to solve world problems in um, inverted kind of way the whole um the secret layer of the tnt group was underneath a flower shop um, <laughs> in New York. Yeah, so, uh, um, but what i wanted to ask you as well uh because now we're delving into the bit that might have also um triggered some kind of revival um in art um of the occult in art Let's say H.R. Geiger um, would be a good point of reference. Um, was it was he a good point of reference for you? Some um, occult matters within your own art? Mm, no, no, not not Geiger. You know, Geiger, uh, um, of course, we knew through uh, through the alien films. Yeah. Um, and we knew about him, you know, and later, you know, I learned about the whole uh, uh, Hoffman and LSD uh, connection uh, there, and um, his museum and stuff. But no, he wasn't. He wasn't a big influence, mm -hmm. but he was. He was a kind of uh, significant for the times. Maybe this kind of gothicy subcultural uh, thing that was going on in the 80s and 90s. Um, 
uh, where the fantastic, fantastic, uh, and, and uh, you know, punk, uh, splatter punk, uh, etc., uh, was really rife, you know, also in the music scene, you know, bands like Bauhaus and um, Gothic um, uh, music that came from um, from England. So that was super influential, of course, and later Psychic TV and, and, and you know, Coil and stuff like that, Go, really going into the experimental. That was really, I, I see Geiger as a, as a kind of part of that mental I, I makeup of the of yeah. our generation. <laughs> yeah, yeah it was. it's very generational. That's why I, <laughs> I mentioned him. I mean, <laughs> so I would mm-hmm. like to rewind a little bit back um, mm-hmm. into that bit where a, a, a boy from a Catholic background mm-hmm. becomes interested in something that would be banned uh, within um, an environment that would be strictly Catholic, or rather, if not banned, then uh, looked upon as real, but at the mm-hmm. same time of the other side yeah. and <laughs> uh, rejected um, in, yeah, of yeah, in ways yeah. rejected. Not that's what I, I find interesting because my background, my family background, is atheist. Ah, okay. So I come. I mean, they're not entirely atheist. They would disagree that they're atheist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they would say they were agnostic, which is fair enough. Yeah. But the, yeah, whole, the whole idea of, you know, uh, socialism and socialism schooling yeah. and my family, which was very secular, um, they didn't have a problem with my interests. And of course, my uh, wider family, some of them were religious and they had, you know, they had, didn't have a problem with people going to church or anything of that kind. They just simply were not that ill. They're just not, you know, not not in any way restrictive. So they then I had a different, you know, in into it because with them, it was all the imagination. It was Mm. not rejected knowledge. It was just, oh, you know, you're very imaginative. That's lovely. (laughs) You're Mm -hmm. speaking aliens. Wonderful. (laughs) You know, maybe (laughs) write something about that. Um, So I wanted to see with you um, how did that um, link happen and also how did that transition happen? Yeah, I'll uh, try to dig, uh, I have to dig a little bit. Uh, I think, um, you know, because I was so much in, in, into comics, of course, I was reading as well, but I, I wasn't a big reader of books. Uh, so really, w- my reading was through comics. But there was a point that that kind of changed when um, Umberto Eco's uh, The Name of the Rose appeared and, and my, my dad got it somehow and uh, I, I read it uh, and I didn't stop reading from page one, uh, in, uh, you know, to, pay, to the last page, uh, three days long of reading. I was totally, totally into it and totally caught by it and also that world and, and the kind of erudite uh, knowledge that was passed on in this book these things that you didn't know about and kind of were revealed to you and the intensity of it and uh, you know also this is uh, this main character of course who's coming of age is is the same age as you when you read it Mm -hmm. so it was a life changer really um, to to read that book and then I I really started to read more Uh, and uh, you know the the real change Change came uh, not when uh, when I was living at home anymore, but I was in art school and I uh, was living. Uh, I didn't live with my parents anymore, and I w- was an exchange student to England uh, in the '87. And I met a, a guy who uh, we started talking, and he he was into all this kind of magical stuff, and he was talking about you know magical wars between you know warlocks that were happening at the time apparently in the, in, in England. The psychic wars. So, uh, yeah. Psychic psychic wars. <laughs> the British psychic wars of yeah, the eighties. I would say it's no laughing matter, but you know we can we can we can make some of it. Yeah. No, because I, I didn't know anything about all this, you know, and, and uh, so I was kind of, my ears were burning. Uh, and um, at uh, some point he said, you know, you should read uh, this book, uh, the Illuminatus trilogy by uh, Anton, uh, Robert Anton Wilson and, and Robert Shea. 
And so I did. I went to the local um, uh, comic store and uh, they had this uh, this kind of stuff as well. And I, I bought it. And, and again, this was like uh, a nonstop reading event. Uh, I was there for a few weeks. I think uh, it took me a week to, to read the whole uh, trilogy. And I was uh, that kind of introduced me to contemporary magic and um, and a kind of in a kind of anarchistic uh, approach and uh, chaos magic uh, afterwards uh, connected to that. And uh, so that's where the, the the shift happened that you're that you're after. Yes, I think it makes sense because I, I think a lot of people of our generation as well made that connection through comics. Uh, yeah. It's funny that you say that you just read comics and then you started reading books because there we have a connection <laughs> completely. <laughs> again. Uh, again. Um, funnily enough, because yeah. my parents were even worried that I wasn't reading books because I was just reading mm. comics. And I mm. started reading quite early on. So it wasn't that I wasn't interested in intellectual pursuits. I was just not interested in reading books. And yeah. That was the switch also when we came back from Tehran um, to, to Yugoslavia and I we had this literature that we, we needed to read for school and I just found it extremely boring. So mm. I found um, that the, the what I was given as a curriculum, I just found extremely boring. I did it, but I did it with such lack of enthusiasm, <laughs> which, of course, I had plenty for when I was reading my comics and graphic novels afterwards because mm. Yugoslavia had a very very strong graphic novel culture mm -hmm. there was a, a magazine called Stripoteca which um, put out different graphic novels from Rick Kirby and Flash Gordon and Silver Surfer and um, you could you could have a, a very good education um, mm. in graphic novels through Stripoteca and then, of course, various other outlets. So anyway, for me, it was slightly earlier, this switch to books, because I yeah. went into because my dad was like, just find something interesting. Just start reading. Mm. You don't have to read the books they tell you, you know, you don't have to just go, you know, and do your own thing. So anyway, I went into the library and I found this book that's um, in English. It's the uh, Wrinkle in Time from Madeleine Lengel. But um, in Serbian, the translation was the gates of time mm -hmm. yeah that's it <laughs> the gates <laughs> of time. it sounded as a, a comic or a graphic novel so i took it yeah. and yeah. Um, and i read it um and i must have been maybe i don't know 11 mm. or something like that um and and that blew me away because it's about different universes and parallel universes and travel through time and yeah. you know, all the stuff that i really liked and then mm. i thought okay so books can be good <laughs> <laughs> and that was a uh, that was a Yugoslavian author. That, uh... no, no, that's an American author. Ah. Uh, it's an American author. It's uh, written, I think, early 60s, and um, and it was translated into Yugoslavian as the Gates of Time. But ah, it was, I, I think I know what you mean. Is, isn't that Paul called, Anderson? Isn't that the Paul Anderson book? Paul no, Anderson? No, no, no. It was. I don't oh. know made the film no it's it's um she her name is madeline langle and uh, okay sorry i missed that okay no, no no worries and um so what was what was the the idea behind it is that there are there are existent various universes um parallel okay. universes but also that there are portals to these parallel universes and okay. There were also uh, an element of witchcraft in it as well, because she befriends um, some witches, uh. and um, and they have this uh, capacity to time travel. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, yeah. So after that, I went because of course in Yugoslavia, this uh, the literature, there's lots of translations, and it was an open country. It was not really an east. It was not at all an Eastern Bloc country. It was a non-aligned country. So there was uh, a lot of a lot of literature, uh, but not that much literature on the esoteric and the occult. So what I got my first books were like von Däniken, you know. So it was like reading about ancient aliens quite early on, and but then after that I got 
more sophisticated because I wasn't really happy with the level of that what the books were giving me. I wanted more sophistication. Um, yeah. Then I went, I, I um, got introduced with tarot mm. early on. Let's say I was maybe 14, 15. But then, and that was in France that I got introduced to tarot. And there was in uh, the, the festival palace, the um, Cannes Festival Palace, um, at the time, and that was, I think, was 1985, there was a festival of magic that mm-hmm. summer. So I went there and then I got introduced in all sorts of ways that magic can occur, you know, from uh, from tarot readings and also from various kinds of divination and astrology to more specific things. <clears throat> and then I got introduced in, in, into that a bit more. Um, and the first tarot cards that I bought were actually Alistair Crowley's. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Mine too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But that's a third connection. So what was your yeah. um so that's that's kind of my my background from from atheism into the occult. Um right. and, and then afterwards, when, funnily enough, I went into religion. So it's completely mm-hmm. and then and then back somehow into let's say um esoteric realms. Um so, so, so was, you mean you had a religious phase? No, I oh absolutely. Oh, like for sure. All right. Yeah, I had. Um, we can get into that. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot to uh, to connect to what you're just saying, uh, and and it re- uh, reminds me that uh, that I actually skipped uh, a little bit um, uh, the reading part because, of course, uh, what you mentioned uh, about school, I had to do too. I had to do my literature list as well, and we were free to choose our um, our topics, of course. Um, so uh, for English, I read uh, a lot of gothic uh, literature like uh, Frankenstein and Fatek yeah. and uh, um, Dracula uh, they were all on my list so that was uh, that was pretty mind-blowing stuff as well and for my Dutch literature list we of course used to be uh, a colonial uh, power and we had um, Indonesia and there uh, is this kind of animist um, magic uh, tradition that is that they called Guna Guna, and that is really, really uh, present in in a lot of um, uh, Dutch Indonesian uh, literature. This kind of uh, you know uh, contrast between the the Dutch rationalizing of the col- colonies and this kind of irrational um, uh, struggle, you know, with magic against uh, that. Uh, so, for, for instance, a very, very famous book is the the Silent Power. This, this is also um, uh, translated in, into English, and I can recommend uh, you know everybody to read. So, um, yeah, that's by Louis Couperus, uh, who is uh, from the Hague, like like I am. And um, yeah, so so I missed I missed that bit uh, actually. Yeah, so uh, but that led also to uh, the name of the rose, and then to Robert Anton Wilson and book reading in general. Yeah, and Berserk was also one of my favorite um, writers, most definitely. I like for Cole's Pendulum. For me, that was the ultimate. Right. That was the yeah. ultimate because it had everything that I needed in it. <laughs> um, yeah. From, yeah. Yeah. From secret societies to conspiracies to um, book publishers. Um, right. Yeah. I um, and right. what I wanted to um, also when when we go back into that period of time when we were discovering the various ways art related to the subject of the occult. Um, yeah. What was your? Did you have any personal experiences? Did you have a personal experience of the occult? Um, as not unrelated to art, but as a, as a more direct experience that didn't need the medium of art to occur. Mm. I I can't say that I did really. Um, so no, I, I no, I don't it's think. So it's that. so through artistic expression that you then discovered various kinds of uh, occult expressions, let's say. Uh, yeah. And that yeah. Simply because, yeah. uh, from, from my experience, um, it was it was the other way around. Um, mm. I, I needed to have a framework for experiences that I had. Mm. And when I, when I think of what I maybe maybe I didn't phrase it 
um, well. But let's say, did you have as a child precognitive dreams? Uh, did you uh, have experiences of you said that you bought um, Crowley's tarot, so you must have had experiences through working through divination. OK, that is a medium of art, but still it's more direct. Yeah, you know, I, I always found it uh, difficult to to find a good um, approach to uh, to reading um, uh, the tarot a uh, tarot for for a long time uh, until I kind of developed my own uh, set uh, and uh, then I was started really using it. So the the Crowley um, set um, I didn't really use. I just like to look at the the the, the pictures. You know, I really like the pictures. You your own tarot. Am yeah, I, yeah. Wow, yeah. okay. Is this something that's publicly available or is it just for you that you did for well, yourself? Um, I, uh, it's a kind of printing on demand uh, method that I pr published it in and I uh, made, uh, a, uh, what did I get? Six, six uh, I produced for six sets and I've uh, only two left. You know, the other ones um, uh, I've sold actually to, to collectors. So, um, to that uh, possibility for people listening to the podcast, maybe. Um, I would like to have a look at them for sure. Um, I found, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I can uh, them later when we're, when we're um, um, you know, seeing each other again. I, I can show you a little bit uh, of what, what it contains. It's, oh. it's large. It's, it, it's been a long project, uh, actually. It's been uh, like a... a Really, uh, I was getting really into the, the, the connection of, um, or really into the turn, uh, the spiritual turn in, in contemporary art that I wanted to look into. And I, I, I took really uh, tarot as uh, something that has a connection to pub publishing. So as, uh, as uh, you know, the, the tarot as a book. So I actually made a, a textual tarot uh, and it, it came out of a specific process of combining um, yoga exercises and shamanic traveling. Um, and that kind of gave me the content to make the, the cards with. Uh, it's, it's hard to to explain in words uh, all together and it's a it's long story hard. yes yes this is this is a, there's the thing about magic it's very hard to explain in words <laughs> yes it uses words <laughs> it yeah uses words, but it's a, a, a concept that's very hard it's also a very intimate concept of what is magic for me and what is magic for you and what is the yeah. concept of magic for people in general um so maybe that's a good question to ask what is magic for you well um this is like a word like this is like asking what is art for you or what is religion for you or what is spirituality it's for you. It's a lame question, this, I know, but it has to it has to exist. <laughs> I know, I know, and of course I, I'm I'm thinking about it uh, a lot, uh, um, and of course uh, you think about what what is it for me, you know, and um, there's for me there's really two sides of it, but basically it has to do with a uh, kind of intensity of living, a uh, kind of um, sometimes ecstatic um, um, experience. Uh, uh, but there's a there's a kind of daily uh, part of that, you know, when you when you're in uh, a situation where that you feel has a kind of magical vibe to it. Uh, I had one yesterday with my son, uh, you know, we went to this concert he brought me to this concert uh, of uh, American uh, electronic uh, music pioneer called William Bazinski, and he's really into electronic uh, music. And I didn't know the guy, and, uh, so we were uh, in, in the concert hall and uh, enjoying the, the concert. And uh, afterwards, I was I thought, you know, I really have to dig into this um, this this guy a little bit more and learn more w about his history because he's in in his, in his sixties already and um, so I, uh, I I started reading a little bit about him and um, learned that he's already working from the eighties so so really from my formative years uh, early eighties and um, he was first uh, you know issued uh, his his work by uh, David uh, Tibet of um, current 93 
fame and he's really into you know the guy who's into crowley and magic and uh, uh david tibet and and this really brought me uh back to my youth at, at, at the same age that my son is uh, in now and and it's it's this kind of magical alignment that, that suddenly happens over time and over generations uh, so that is the kind of daily a type of magic that I'm, I'm I'm talking about, you know, when you feel a kind of uh, intensified living uh, happening. I think that's yeah. a wonderful like, uh, uh, way of explaining it, of intensified living and alignment. These two words, yeah. the intensity and alignment, is it's a it's a full life. Yeah. It's it's a mo- yeah. the moment in the patterning of life when there is a fullness of life experienced. Right. And it's an a causal connection so it's it's a uh, synchronistic right. yeah so yeah. It, it has it has seemingly no cause and yeah. effect but it actually is connected in a patterning that we figure out a small part of and go wow this is just an amazing and yeah. <laughs> very cognizant yeah. kind of pattern but it's part of a larger pattern i find it um very interesting to talk about uh, people's ideas of magic because there's such different con- concepts of it that as they are of concepts of art of course and yeah um i i find it for, for me it's uh has to do with getting into the a current of things so the current mm-hmm. exists and then i pick up on a particular current and mm-hmm. then i ride that current and that current brings me into places that I wouldn't have otherwise gone through just rational means. And right. so that's part of the idea that I have of magic, which is very broad because yeah. it also has to do with experiences that I didn't ask for. Right. Starting as a child, I didn't I didn't go seeking for experience and then having an experience. The experience happened to me and then I had to find ways to understand that experience. Mm. Mm-hmm. Let's say um, when I started to do divinations, because the way I did the first time I started doing them was there was this magazine in um, in Yugoslavia. Um, and I think it was even not the, the Taina, which was an esoteric magazine. It was just a regular magazine that had like different kinds of things. And it said, oh, this if you want to divine from playing cards, this is a method. Mm-hmm. And I was never interested in playing cards as such. So I was, you know, really rubbish at anything that, you know, not any not bridge, note poker, nothing of that sort, just not interested but then mm-hmm. I took a, a pack of just simple playing cards and I went, OK, let's try. And I started doing it and I went so into it and I became so interested in it. And then people would ask me to look at their cards. This was when I was 13, 14. And I started divining for people and then they would go like, wow, that's <laughs> that's how how's that possible? Mm-hmm. And that's how I became interested in like, that's the thing. How is this possible? What is it that I'm doing? Mm. What is it that's happening? Why mm. Why do I have access to this knowledge? Yeah, I think um, it, uh, you need to have a, a kind of a special receptivity uh, to it. Uh, it's not for it's not with everyone that has that, you know. Um, and uh, the the others, uh, you know, it's just like dreaming. You know, everybody dreams, but not everybody reminds remembers their dreams really or really works with them so uh, yeah there's this other side of of magic besides the 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 kind of the daily uh, um, uh, part and then and there's then there's the other uh, part that is uh, really i think connected to um, practice uh, and um, a kind of conceptual framework that you build around it uh, and that you work from uh, which which uh, makes it very specific and that is really yeah doing magic so to speak um, and that is ceremonial uh, magic that you're talking about really. yes for for me it's also uh, for me it's really, really connected to play, to to uh, to doing a game almost, you know, the game uh, decides, uh, you know, the, is the, the 
conceptual framework that that decides the the outcome for a large part you know or how you read it or how you relate to it uh, something like that and um yeah that is also for me the connection with art so uh, really uh, what uh, what you uh, bring into the game so to speak uh, uh gets activated and then you get a situation where um one and one might be three Yes, that, it's, and that, it's the ritual part of um, the. It's connected to ritual in art and magic within a ritual and the ceremonial magic, which is a vast field. But let's um, talk about your connection to it, and I think it'd be a good uh, point now. I, I think we're already maybe 45 minutes in, and we haven't <laughs> mentioned yet. <laughs> Chris, <Okay>. telling me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. if you don't mind telling us a little bit about, no, not a little, you can talk a lot um, about um, your connection uh, with a serialist um, artist and the way uh, he influenced you and your exhibition, The Great Invocation. So it's it's a good time to talk about that because we started talking um, about the uh, what people would really call the occult. So mm-hmm. ceremonial magic, people that have very structured ways of dealing with magical forces mm-hmm. and the way this connects with art. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, my art practice um, is kind of um, has two sides to it. Uh, there's, uh, you know, almost like the what I told uh, said about the the magic, uh, you know, having two sides. You know, there's the daily practice, being in the studio and and just uh, 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 kind of um, playing around and uh, and uh, stuff like that. And then uh, from that uh, kind of play, uh, sometimes larger um, projects kind of distill themselves almost. Um, and they, or a family of works, uh, a few works become a family, something like that. And so the Seligman uh, work uh, came after uh, the uh, period where the actually what we were just talking about uh, the tarot set was uh, coming out of and this kind of uh, public uh, performances that uh, that I did with them um you know combining uh, yoga exercises and and shamanic traveling and having you know the public uh, being part of that and and uh, in creating uh, a set of um What's it called? A re- report, report cards. So what they were, you know, when they were doing the traveling, the mental traveling, they uh, brought an experience out of the cards, you know, suggested by the cards and then moved into their kind of mental domain and came out of it with a with a story after the the, the traveling. And they would note it on, on these um, uh, report cards and have a whole collection of those which are amazing. Uh, because it works every time, you know, it's uh, it's it's really uh, effective. Um, uh, so uh, I was kind of um, I thought, you know, I, I really like this work, and uh, uh, but I, the aspect that I don't like about it is being so much in the work and having to connect with, uh, you know, and uh, on, on a performative in a performative situation with the public. So I really wanted to go back uh, to my studio again. And I have, I was having a bit of a break uh, during the Christmas, and I was reading um, the biography of uh, of Willem de Kooning, a Dutch painter from Rotterdam, uh, who uh, ended up in New York, New York school uh, artist. And he, um, I, I read this really interesting passage about him, um, you know, being one of the first people actually to to start a, an an artist space, an artist uh, platform for uh, meeting for artists and and showing the work and sharing the work and discussing their work. And it was called the club. And it, then the book said, you know, it had this um, interesting artist called Kurt Seligman uh, doing a lecture about uh, black magic. Mm-hmm. And I said, what? and so I wondered, you know, I've never heard of uh, an, an artist connected to to the New York School called Kurt Seligman. Uh, who is this guy? So and about black magic? Wow, I have to know more. So I started uh, looking into him, and the first thing I found was 
uh, this uh, this set of etchings that he did. Uh, he did a, a series of etchings uh, based on the myth of uh, Oedipus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I saw that, it was like looking in the mirror, like uh, I could have made that. So I got ev- interested even more. And then I really started digging into uh, in, into Kurt Seligman. And, uh, and then I kind of re rediscovered the, the surrealists again and their stories. Uh, but the, the, yeah, Kurt Seligman was the, the, the surrealist uh, specialist on, uh, on magic and the occult. And he wrote his book, um, uh, The Mirror of Magic. And yeah, I at some point, um, it was getting so thick, our relationship, uh, that I uh, decided to uh, kind of adopt him as, as, a, as a father. Uh, as a father, as a as a kind of uh, I say uh, mentor or artistic mentor um, or just family, just basic family. No, like really like a forefather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the, on the mental plane, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, and and really uh, have a dialogue with him through through uh, through the work, through his work, through my work. You know, and kind of ev- evoking him into the studio. And, uh, and that became a whole series of, uh, of works that was uh, 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 presented at, uh, at the Great Invocation mm-hmm. in, in Rotterdam. When, uh, now I have to dig a little bit deeper into the Invocation part, although I know it's very difficult to verbalize uh, the state people are in when they're connected mm-hmm. in that kind of way. What would you what would you um, compare it most? I mean, it is a sort of an ecstasy or just a flow um, in a mm-hmm. communication, um, and it's a it's a form of um, telepathic communication with the spirit of someone that you're relating to. Mm-hmm. All of those things at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's a knowing as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, of course, the the um, uh, the surrealists, um, you know, uh, one of their methods uh, was uh, automatism, and automatism is really um, mindlessly uh, doing something uh, which opens up the channels to the to the subconscious and brings. Um, its content to the surface, uh, so to speak. But um, Seligman was critical of that. He he said, um, you know, this was a uh, Breton who uh, who theorized it, and Breton was a writer, and um, Seligman, of course, was a visual artist, and he um, he thought, you know, there's a, when you when you do automatism automatism in art, you know, you can't really escape. Uh, choice making in in art making so it it, it is a, also a conscious pro- process there's a, there's an a priori brought into play um so it can't be full um pure uh, yes. psych yes. yeah I, I have to say I, I do agree more with Seligman than Breton although I really love Breton oh, me too <laughs> I totally <laughs> um, agree it, with it's, it it's as well. because the whole idea of channeling which of course mm-hmm. exists um in various forms in various practices Um, What I find in art is that it's a kind of a lazy concept because there needs to be a collaboration. If you're collaborating, let's say in a very blatant way, let's say you're collaborating with a spirit. Mm -hmm. It could be an occult practice, but it's a collaboration. So Mm -hmm. so you are making choices within what you are manifesting. You might have an input, but Mm -hmm. it is you who are the manifester. So because yeah. you're the manifesto, you are the one that chooses the way this manifesting will take place. So even yeah. automatic writing or in channelings um, that, you know, the famous channelings of, let's say, Alistair Crowley, uh, mm. which well, I don't think he even termed them channelings. But, um, yeah, he was possessed by spirits and then he went forth and wrote um, the book of the law, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, but this idea that somebody is it's a very mediumatic I don't know if it's even a word (laughs) but it's a it's an idea of an artist as a medium Mm -hmm. um, working within a media when in Mm -hmm. fact um, the artist is more of a magician a manifester and therefore Mm -hmm. collaborating Mm -hmm. with 
rather than being a medium for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, the way that I see it is, um, uh, you know, there is this thing, uh, you know, this dynamic, this uh, back and forth dynamic that you might use the, the term invocation and evocation for in the way that uh, when you see uh, you are having actually a dialogue with the material that is making up the image that is uh, coming out of the material, so to speak. And when you see the material have, uh, as having, you know, its own character and quality and maybe even spirit, um, then you are really um, uh, projecting, as what, what you just explained, but also uh, it itself the material kind of emanates yeah so there's this back and forth between you you have this dialogue going on and and that is uh, for me what it, what is going on there yeah and this is why i uh, um I'm really what i'm working on now is finding actually ways of introducing uh this idea of automatism in the way that i understand it as i just uh, explained uh into printmaking i don't think anybody did that so much uh, before I, I don't see it only if you of course uh, the famous um example of uh, decalcomania which is really a basic form of printing uh th that is where where it's happening in in surrealism but they, they they didn't really took it as print so they they just took it as uh, a stain uh that that suggests something that uh, that it, that can uh, evocate um and uh, then you, <laughs> you no, that's, that's that. very connected let's say to to reading tea leaves or reading coffee uh, no, it's yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> because that's that's the main. I mean, in, in these parts in in the Balkans, reading coffee cups um, is probably something that's not. You know, you, it's so spread that people yeah. that even are not in any way practicing any form mm -hmm. of esoteric in their lives, let's say, um, and even people that are maybe quite religious, because Balkans is quite, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of um, Orthodox Christianity and also a lot of pagan practices. Mm. A lot of, I mean, even the patron saint of the family, which is a very you know, Serbian thing, is actually, again, from the patron of the family from before um, the Slavs took um, Christianity. So, a lot of elements are elements of old religions and yeah. and part of it is just how people very very easily sink into practices that are absolutely not christian practices while maintaining a, a christian practice within let's say going to liturgy on sundays and so forth so the orthodox church itself um is at the same time of course not very in, inclined towards saying that it's okay absolutely not but it's not very forceful in stopping these practices simply because it understands its people and so it's very interesting how that um, connection occurs because it is i think very important in in this new revival of orthodoxy that people are going back to orthodoxy because they're not losing their everyday practices which have absolutely nothing to do with christianity as are the reading of coffee cups so back to to you now and and um and the way things can be read um from prince what you yeah. what you're telling uh, me is is very interesting to me as well because it, it also kind of reinforces the idea that that the, the the conceptual framework within you know for this where this practice is happening is is so important in what 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 they um what the outcome of it is you know so um yeah no I'm, i've just uh, started with this and it also connects to something very personal of, of course the myth of osiris uh, is um is very significant uh, it's kind of this uh, god who dies and then resurrects 
and is uh, kind of uh, put together by um, his uh, sister spouse. Uh, and, and this is how I work really as well. This is the automatism that I use. I, I use kind of uh, forms that I uh, use again and again in different combinations, kind of constitutes the, the automatism for me. Uh, but it also is to do with my personal experience uh, of um, of death and resurrection uh, since I uh, had um, you know, since I died actually basically uh, three years ago and kind of came back to life again. I was uh, on my bike and I had a heart attack and then a policeman um, uh, you know re um, reanimated me. So it's it's a kind of uh, it's kind of larger myth kind of projected on on, uh, on my own personal experience and kind of um, going through that uh, through my art, uh, giving it a place, maybe. So that's why yes. I work. It is personal experiences that we have, I find, are contained, not just contained in myths, but are given more um, context and more material to work with because the experiences are so explosive that they could possibly tear apart our entire cognitive space and awareness of what life is. And the way the myths then uh, th that we adopt and yeah. work with, not, I mean, explain would be a very banal word, but give layers and dimensions to our experiences that become, that ground us in a way. You know, for me, the myths are there more to ground us rather than anything else. Ground us uh, in the sense that this is something that is not only our experience, but that is an experience that has a history to it. And that is um, that is a human experience, but that is also an experience that has a, a multidimensionality to it. And that would be for yourself, the Osiris myth and the resurrection of Osiris. Yeah. Uh, and also, I assume that this is my assumption because Isis is also an extremely important part of that myth. Super, yeah. Yeah, being the anima that comes in and finds all the missing parts. Right. It's really uh, the, the kind of the... Uh, um, uh, the creative force putting the feminine force, things together. Yeah, yeah. The feminine force within and also possibly without as well, outside and inside as well, connecting to the to that force that puts together. Um, I mean, then there will be a third person also um, in this myth, which would be Seth. Yeah. Um, uh, the antagonist. Right. As well. Um, so it takes apart. Yes, a and, very important uh, uh, a person, a person working from the shadows, but yeah, but yeah. nevertheless working. Uh, yeah, it's a, a bit of a Luciferian uh, figure. I, this is how I read him. You know, like a rebellious um, guy who, uh, who who wants to take things apart. That's how he looks uh, at the world. You know, that's that's us really, how we are now. You know, that's uh, that's uh, Seth. Seth in it's a Sethians society uh, right and also um the idea of seth being envious of osiris mm -hmm. is also yes a very important element and feeling mm -hmm. that he is not as elevated as osiris and right. the revenge element as well in the story right. Right. And also the sibling element in the story. So the connection, the family connection of all these parts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Not, yeah, that's I think that's very important. So that, that we are always connected towards uh, with the with something that tears us apart in a very familial way. Mm -hmm. Whether it be within us or, or something that's outside of us, but it is it is our kin. Right. The enemy is our kin, and that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, uh, in, inside of us, part of us, uh, you know, within the same family, etc. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a family drama. <laughs> exactly, exactly. On <laughs> 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 mythical <laughs> level, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, family, family drama. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask you as well, because um, your work is, of course, um, very much about the revival of Wiccan practices, neo-pagan practices, the revival of elements that were lost in a certain period of time, history, but were really never lost, but just kind of um, lost in their potency, maybe, um, in the outside world. Mm-hmm. Um, we can speak about um, what happened in the Age of Enlightenment and then, of course, what happened in the 19th century, um, the, the spiritualist revivals and the way that, let's say, Steiner connected the spiritual to the scientific and not only him, quite a lot of others as well. That's kind of the early 20th century and how this um, need to connect the spiritual with the scientific really was a way for people to try and bridge that loss felt in generations of losing almost uh, a whole area of interest, which is the interest um, in the unusual, in the in the spiritual that's not prescribed by the religious. Mm-hmm. And and then how this revival actually went through um, the artistic practices of the 20th century into the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Full blown. <laughs> um, mm-hmm revival of the esoteric arts yeah. and how you connected that in, within your work and what your um, opinion is of mm-hmm. why this is now so widespread mm-hmm. yeah and i have to say when i started out it wasn't the situation uh, so much um, i think um, i see a kind of turnaround you know this spiritual turn uh, really located around uh, 2008 when it, when articles started being written and published mm-hmm. in art magazines about this uh, new uh, yeah in this in this uh, new interest in in these matters and uh, how they uh, are activated in in art practices uh, really um, explicitly really i have a, a very similar experience because my interest in the esoteric never waned. Um, not only did it not wane, it's just a, a part of my life from from the start, really. And but I was always the eccentric, and I found people that had interest as well, and we would talk about it. But it would not be something I would even mention in a conversation with generally with people. Um, and then suddenly, <laughs> it started becoming the conversation. And I don't know if you share that experience. But what I found slightly annoying is that it became extremely superficial and very commercialized very quickly. So mm. suddenly I was I was the one telling people, no, 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 you have to really maybe dig a bit more deeper into this. It's not uh, that very straightforward. Or maybe you should before you start any, um, let's say, divinatory practices or spiritual practices, maybe you would also be well advised to go through a certain initiation process into them because you're opening yourself up and so on and so on. And people would just stare at me and not really, um, you know, they, I was just um, messing up with their fun. I was a party pooper. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and then <Take> that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also in, in 2009, I wanted to do a PhD um, that would connect my background in psychology and also in the history of film and mm-hmm. talk about uh, an, the film as medium as a medium of enchantment. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do that at Goldsmiths. And that first of all, it was really well received and I found people that would um, tutor me. But then suddenly it just went all belly up. And mm. and that's another different story. But all I want to say about that is when you mentioned that year, 2008 and nine, I was mm. only remembering how at that time that what I wanted to do and work on was not really understood or taken okay. at Goldsmiths and um Last year, um, I went to a conference that my my friend uh, Vanna Goldblow actually um, organized uh, at Goldsmiths about um, uh, spirituality <laughs> in the yeah. 20th century um, in uh, in the media and the arts. Mm-hmm. And, and I was thinking like, okay, 
So yeah, it took like from 2009 um, to 2023 mm -hmm. uh, for me to kind of go there and then and then have not just me, of course, like all the people that are convened there, but in my personal journey to to then um, present a paper that was based on my work from 2009 and, and everything else. So it's um, it, you could see that huge shift and mm. opening up but at the same time. It the way it opened up, it opened up in a very commercial and yeah. uh, I would say destructive way um, mm -hmm. towards towards yeah. what is what is what was just um, a path for certain people uh, and a, also a craft because a lot of people that went that uh, that were on the path whether they were on path of a natural magic let's say or path of ceremonial um, works um, it is a very dedicated path that takes a lot of time and a lot mm. of work and you're for yourself as well and then suddenly it opens up and everybody has um, almost the same kind of opinion about mm. it as yourself. <laughs> mm. Anyway, so yeah, I wanted to hear your thoughts about that side of the revival. Yeah, I really have to re recapitulate in a little bit, um, you know, the whole itinerary of uh, of my work as, as it has been uh, the last, um, I think, 20 years or so, maybe even a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this turn and uh, this this happened within our generation with, and, and was also kind of, um, uh, you know, I think our generation more or less was uh, an just a little bit previous, maybe uh, was uh, was the catalyst uh, of it. Uh, uh, so when I started uh, in, um, I think I, I started in in 2006, six, I think I started um, a series of work that was based on pretty much my my big interest in in megalithic um, sites. And, you know, I've, I've Ever since I visited uh, Stonehenge with my parents, I've I've had this uh, obsession with them, and they're in the Netherlands as well. And whenever we go on a holiday, we go to the sites that are near. And uh, so I wanted to work with them. And um, really, what I learned from that work, uh, or what I realized much more from that work, uh, was that these sites are actually still active uh, quite yeah. a bit. Or activated <laughs> activated by by people you know who who use them still you know as power centers and um uh so that got me really into looking at contemporary pagan practices starting from the people that are actually using these uh, these um me megalithic sites and that kind of got me to the the wicca connection mm -hmm. uh when uh, when looking starting to look into contemporary uh, pagan practices and so then i kind of started looking is, has there been uh, artists actually who who really have been using neo-paganism as um well again conceptual framework for their work um and that brought me to the work not it's not well known, actually, he's not known as an artist at all. Uh, but uh, to the work of uh, Frederick Adams, an American who was um, one of the people who really brought Wicca to America, uh, to California in this case, and started his own group there uh, and changed it to a more uh, Dianic uh, Greek-oriented uh, coven, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and he really. Um, uh, created his own whole wheel of the year and uh, rituals uh, and they were really artistically conceived and um, then I found out um, that a Dutch uh, guy from Amsterdam actually had worked with Frederick Adams in the 80s or 90s to write down all the rituals to uh, fully conceptualize them and to publish them. So I, I, I um, looked up this guy and he was still running a, a kind of a gardenerian coven uh, from Amsterdam. And I started taking part in the, in the, in the rituals. Uh, I didn't fully uh, do the whole wheel of the year 
uh, with them because I also found out I, you know, what you just mentioned, you have to be disciplined to do this, you know, <laughs> yeah. you really have to have the discipline for it. And I, and, and I don't, I, I really don't. I don't know if, if it's got to do with a kind of rebellion against my Catholic, Catholic uh, upbringing or something, but um, no, it's, it's, because it's, it's very, it's, it's a ritual practice. So, the fact that it's a ritual practice um, that's uh, neo-pagan um, or yeah. Wiccan, um, it doesn't make it less. I mean, I have also, uh, I don't, or very rarely had um, participation in ceremonies, but I would say that an everyday natural magic practice for me is the, the how it works. And I don't know if it has to do so much uh, with the idea of not having discipline because this is also a sort of discipline um, mm. but it is I think I have a, a, a general problem with ritual <laughs> mm -hmm. and I have no idea where it comes from I might have to think about what it comes why this is so but I think that it's it has to do with a rebellious spirit but it mm. also has to do with things being prescribed because I mm. had find my own way into it so I mm. had to find my own way into it and suddenly somebody's telling me no you will now follow this and mm. it doesn't work for me maybe if I started early on in ceremonial maybe I wouldn't have such a problem with it but now it's just simply you know I don't in, in a way for me it's like I really don't need that mm -hmm. I, yeah. I can access that what you're accessing in my own way so yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's just generally just an input. Um, sorry, um, please do go on. <laughs> I wanted no, to. No, I, 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 I have the same, although I, I think um, uh, Frederick, uh, uh, his group, uh, by the way, is called Fer Fer Feria, uh, the celebration of the wild. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and uh, he, I think his group, uh, it was really a co communal um, uh, dynamic. So everybody contributes, you know, to the to the ritual pretty much. And that was the case with um, with the group in uh, Amsterdam as well. So it wasn't really rigid uh, in that uh, ritual, uh, ri uh, you know, ritualistically rigid or something. It was really co-creative. Uh, so that was nice about it. But it's just, uh, you know, having to be somewhere on a certain time, uh, being in time, etc. It's it's <laughs> that is, it, that's it, more that, what I found most interesting, actually, is that I like to be a guest. So I don't like to be part of any group <laughs> i need that distance as well yeah, yeah. i uh, i'm an observer more than a practitioner that is also why i uh, uh you know i really enjoyed the the, uh, the white dress you know the the, the terror based um, uh, work that i did uh but also gave up on it um yeah i, I couldn't be um so much the observer anymore i really had to uh, participate and uh, yeah so not my guy, kind of thing really but what i what i realized as well with you know with ferferia and 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 wicca and the way that it's um happening now i feel always this uh, this kind of uh, ecological crisis uh, thing behind it you know uh, this 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 distance uh, of uh, humans to nature and having to bridge the gap somehow and rich realize that and, and I, I can totally understand that you know I, I, th this was one of the beautiful things actually with uh, with Wicca uh, following the wheel of the year that it really brings you in that that kind of natural rhythm of the seasons and uh, you, you know there's a story around it and it's beautiful altogether you know I really enjoyed that well it offers various techniques and ways to reconnect yeah to a yeah. society that's disconnected yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. That was really the the basis, you know. So going from um, the, the the work with the megaliths to the work with the uh, the pagan practices and going into shamanic practices and tarot reading and uh, also kind of uh, uh, you know formalizing it in in yoga exercises. Uh, and then um, going back into the studio again and uh, discovering Seligman and, uh, you know, having this uh, uh, 
father son relationship and this is this was also a really personal work because this also came out of the fact that that my father died and and that kind of uh threw me into a a crisis a spiritual crisis mm-hmm. uh also being a father myself it was it was really difficult uh, time so um yeah this is this is how uh, how the the you shape uh, your own story uh, through art and, and and making it personal, but also yeah, what you what you want to talk about is um, the, the return of the spiritual. Then so that was 2008. I started my work with the tarot around 2012, I think, until 2015, and then from 15 to a few years ago. You know, this dude, this dude, the, the Seligman work was like five or six years, so till um, early uh, 20s, uh, 2020s. And um, yeah, then. Uh, and the, the way that what I wanted to actually possibly just kind of go back to that is that somebody that comes from a, um, a practice that was very dedicated um, and very thorough and lasted decades, actually because it started in your teens and then it developed. So it had a path of development, let's say. Mm-hmm. There's a path of development where you go. I could also do a parallel to, with with what I went through. So there's a path of development that has started from very basic um, experiences and practice, well, complex experiences, but basic practices. <laughs> um, and literature that was very new age to more specialized a literature to meeting people in different uh, environments, having different uh, spiritual practices to then my own practice and then connection with religion back and forth. And and then through that, um, connecting it with my artistic practice and and so on. And then coming to and always doing that sort of as a side stream to to my life. Mm-hmm. And and understanding that um, development within myself and then arriving at an age um, which we're living through now. And it's mm-hmm. I possibly maybe the last five, six, seven years. I don't think it's even more than that. Um, the explosion happened in a way that an explosion happened in the 1960s, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, 70s. And then it went into something that is a bit different and possibly darker in the sense that it, it it became I think it always becomes darker when it becomes extremely commercialized and it loses its essence and its path so a lot of people are coming into it mm-hmm. blown into it without having this previous experience and this previous path that would then navigate them through new experiences and knowledge that they are now coming into contact with mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it's it's almost like it's it's uh, it's somebody that very often is not even ready to have certain experiences and that in the olden times required a very serious initiation process and even in the times that we went through uh, mm-hmm. much looser and much kind of um free form um but still required time and and also bad experiences along with amazing epiphanies there's these parts that are quite difficult to go through and possibly sometimes quite terrifying so uh, it's opening up all these elements of cognition and and the revival also of the neo shamanism and the revival of um uh, the corandero practices all of that at the same time, although it's fantastic, has this undercurrent of um, a revolution that could at the same time eat up <laughs> the um, the people participating in it, as revolutions often do. Or is this? I mean, this is kind of my my view now, uh, but I don't know if you share it or or. Mm, well, I, uh, I I teach, of course. I teach uh, in the Hague uh, at art uh, school, and uh, this uh, spiritual turn in art is really happening with the new generation uh, still, uh, you know, still uh, going on. 
and um, I, I I think it's it's been taken quite seriously. So um, uh, of course it it kind of connects to the urgencies of uh, of of their generation, you know, the, which is of course uh, still the, uh, the the environment, and then there's uh, th- this whole question around identity and and gender identity and post colonialism, and I think it's it's gaining actually in in depth uh, quite a bit um, uh, in that in that sense, and showing uh, actually uh, more and more potential to uh, to dealing with these uh, things. So. So um, uh, no, I'm 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 quite positive about it actually because I think um, if if it has to come from somewhere, the change of mentality that we need it, it needs to come from the arts because it it won't happen anywhere else. Uh, and and in in the long run and and hope uh, it, it it doesn't take too long or um, it, it's too late. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it will have an effect. I, I'm sure of that. Um, you know, it, it really art always uh, expresses the urgencies of uh, of its time. So um, and and deals I'm, with I'm it. Very, I'm, yeah, I'm very uh, happy to hear it. Actually, because you are in contact, of course, with young people through uh, your um, professorial work and scholastic work. And for me, I think it's mostly that I see the spirit of the times um, through online, of course, yeah. and possibly through channels that when I encounter them, I just um, taken aback at the level of superficiality that they exhibit. And I think there's there's a level, and I think a lot of practitioners actually um, talk about it. Um, I quite like uh, Sphere and Sundry um, and um, Caitlin Kopic, actually the Kopics, Austin and Caitlin. Um, and, and she talks about um, her magical practice and uh, her work with Materia and the way it kind of opened up a whole cottage industry <laughs> of people doing exactly the same thing, but not necessarily with the same dedication and background and work and uh-huh. effort and years put into understanding what you're dealing with and yeah. her frustration as well. And I think there's an element to it uh, that I, and then also other people as well, but I mean, she, the, the, she came to mind first, actually, um, when talking about people that are in the work for a very long time, opening, suddenly becoming very popular because of it, but at the same time, also birthing quite a lot of other practices that don't have that history. Mm-hmm. that she has and the way she can then see how some of those practices can be detrimental for people because people just simply don't know what they're doing they think they do because they don't have much knowledge in it um but yeah so that was that was more my i'm absolutely sure that there's many people that are taking the practices very seriously yeah, and exactly. that yeah. i wouldn't want to take away from that i'm just talking okay. about um the the greater public let's say Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. the way that elements are commercialized by people that are actually really not practitioners or are very um kind of casual let's say in their practices so that was more but that's more my concern rather than that there will be people that are very serious about their work which i also encounter and i'm extremely excited about that as well well Um, there may uh, there may be an evolution in that, you know, because, um, of course, uh, us being of uh, the Gen X uh, generation, we also know more or less uh, a, a different world. You know, sometimes I feel like like coming from another planet, you know, <laughs> uh, where uh, from from a generation that, where the, the in, impact of uh, of uh, social democracy, even Marxism, uh, was so uh, something so different from what we, what uh, the young people are, are raised in now. You know, this this extreme um, commercialized uh, neoliberal uh, culture that they're that they're coming from. But I th- I think this generation also starts seeing the flaws of that. You know, and and start. 
uh, uh, going against uh, the flaws of it and and, uh, and working uh, against it and and using uh, the flaws as as the weak spots actually to to take uh, uh, power from. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm quite hopeful actually. Yeah, in, in that's, I mean, yes, you're, you're quite the the twenty somethings. Um, yeah. The twenty somethings are the the people that really when what is it now 20 to 24 so they were yeah. mostly born in um early noughties right uh, yeah. and so early noughties maybe mid noughties so they would be people that were raised completely online they're not yeah. so they are they're now they are now doing a different um we were gen x were a generation that uh, turned towards the um 3d reality into the dimensions of the virtual and mm -hmm. gen z and then the generations following gen z are generations that are actually doing the backward flip mm -hmm. <laughs> from yeah. from what is the virtual into the more grounded uh, yeah I, I i hope so i i think so it, it i i can't imagine it otherwise actually um you know so yeah well um i wanted to before we wound up this amazing conversation which i have to say uh was a complete delight to have with you it was oh, uh, thank you so much <laughs> so, it, was, like, <laughs> it was like playing jazz with somebody and that was oh, just, wonderful yeah um, I wanted to ask you because I'm particularly interested in uh, re in relation to place. I really like to do pilgrimages um, to certain spots that I'm very connect well that I feel a connection to. And one of the very important points in the UK for me is um, the Glastonbury um, and uh, Glastonbury tour and mm -hmm. the whole idea of Avalon and. I went there in year 2000 um, for the first time, and then I kept going back. And in the UK, because uh, I'm also British and I've been in, lived in London 20 years, that's my power spot, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's the place where I go to recharge my batteries. There's also mm -hmm. one other place um, in Essex that is an um, Orthodox Christian monastery both um, uh, monks and nuns. So it's a mixed uh, monastery, very interesting um, place, very interesting place. So these are the two places which are completely, one would say unrelated, but for me, they're completely related because they re relate to the two parts of myself. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of what I do with Christian practices, and then I'm also very open to various different practices that came before um, mm -hmm. my Christian practice and so on. But um, what I wanted to ask you is this particular idea of places mm -hmm. that have cultivated certain energies um, and that your work has been revolving around this element as well. If you don't mind just telling us a little bit more about um, about the idea of a place having this spirit. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, of energy, let's say. Well, thanks. Uh, you know, I um, I have to admit that more and more I start realizing that actually this is for me my birthplace, The Hague. Oh. Um, and uh, I, I, we left it uh, th over 30 years ago, um, live somewhere else now. Uh, just 20 minutes down the road but uh, uh, yeah um, this is for me uh, yeah there's there's a lot of, of my formative years that I, that I've spent there uh, friends that I made and things that happened and also the place itself uh, uh, it's it's kind of connected to uh, the, the esoteric history of um, of Europe as well in a way uh, with um, the, the the Winter King uh, court and and their interest in uh, in alchemy and um, the connection with uh, with Prague and Rudolf, uh, so it has that same quality for me. I think uh, I've never been to Prague. I'm I'm, I'm intending to go there this year, uh, but um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the same is happening over there and for and otherwise, you know, actually uh, London also. Um, and I think we might have met actually in London because um, 
you were hanging out in the same places where where we uh, would go, you know, the ICA and I think uh, Lux. And October and Lux Gallery does. as well, because October Sorry. Gallery. The October Gallery. Oh, I've n- I, no, I, I wanted to uh, go to the October Gallery. I've never been there. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I still, uh, it still uh, exists, uh, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, yeah, it, I should go one day before it, it, it's, uh, it's gone. It, it, uh, and, and, uh, and also Paris. Paris yeah. is, a, is a great city to be for me uh, as well. It yeah. has the same qualities. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, these are, um, I find those particular places to be of utmost importance if I get, let's say, disaligned with myself, you know, yeah. if, if I find myself too, too, because uh, environments really affect me a great deal. And I, I <clears throat> suppose that that happens to a lot of people, especially people that are particularly sensitive to um, the vibes of a place that I cannot do it with my own practice to get back into myself and realign going to certain places does it for me it's almost like going for surgery <laughs> in a way you know it's just spiritual surgery uh, or even not to to sometimes it's surgery sometimes it's very um drastic but usually it's maybe just a spot um what 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 is what is nofi sad like in that sense um it's it's a very interesting um uh place because it's a crossroad of empires yeah so, uh, on the Danube, um, yeah. on the, from north of the Danube, you have Middle Europe, which is Novi Sad, really, and the, the history of Novi Sad is mostly um, Middle Europe, um, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then also um, going further into the past, not only the Romans, but the Celts. There yeah. was, Celts were here, and you can right. feel that in layers and upon layers um, yeah. of, of, um, of the quality of what is happening here you can feel the celtic influence as well yeah. as of course the slavic people that came and then for the south slavs in particular they were mostly in the balkans so the balkans stop geographically really um in novi sad oh, okay and, 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 so, and there's some uh, is there some uh, uh, old europe uh, excavation sites maybe even connected to uh, maria gimbutas uh, that kind of uh, stuff there there is there are many in, extremely interesting uh, locations that go back into the Neolithic times, uh, right. which is a completely different, um, like Vincha, for in, instance. Um, Vincha, so, yeah, Vincha side, right? Yeah, Vincha, yeah. yeah, it's very close and, to here. It's actually near Belgrade, but Belgrade is like 100 kilometers from here, so it's yeah. all it's all these parts. Uh, but yeah. uh, under the Petrovaradin fortress as well, there are different layers because. The Ottoman Empire came to, this was really the border between the Ottomans and the Austro-Hungarians as well. And it's a crossroads. And the crossroads are always places um, of extreme spiritual activity. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so in a way, it's having the house on a crossroads, which is not great. <laughs> because the house requires a home actually requires less of um, less drama and but from the point of view of an observer and from the point of view of history it's an extremely exciting and interesting and at the same time very difficult place of uh, the clash not only of different cultures <laughs> uh, which is um, in the sense of Vojvodina, which is north of Serbia, and Novi Sad, um, was not really a clash of cultures. It was an intermingling and of cultures that created a different culture, which is beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, if we want to talk about psychic wars, and why not for the end of the show, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. there is an element of um, of warfare at the same time. Yeah. Different strands of beliefs and cultures positioning mm. themselves in a particular place. And yeah. although this was more to do what was going on in the Balkans and, of course, in the 90s during the Civil War, but at the same time now on a more uh, larger political scale as happening uh, in the world at, at the moment, at the same time, I, th- I find it also to be happening within layers and layers of history in this place so from 
Vavidna being a place that's actually quite peaceful and um, loves the coexistence and has lots and lots of nationalities um, mm. working together and mixing and creating a new kind of form of expression mm. of culture, mm-hmm. it has now become much more fraught. Mm. So that's yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the it is it is a fraught place now. And it, I never until the 90s, I never felt it as fraught. Mm. And and even in the 90s, well, everything was kind of although it was part of what was going on, it was still in a way less. It was just less violent. It was less violent because we learn how to coexist mm-hmm. with others um in a in a very um also in a very artistic way it's a very artistically orientated place so the winds of war and the the warrior side of the balkans is very much um, felt now everywhere and also in Vojvodina, which was not the case before so it makes me worried it makes me yeah. worried. I, yes. I can uh, understand. Yeah, well, I, I really hope that uh, that I uh, once will be able to make it. I'm starting to get more and more interested, actually, in uh, in Eastern uh, European. Uh, last year, um, I was in uh, in Warsaw. Beautiful experience. Hope to go to Prague, you know, um, and its heritage. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully I can uh, move down south a little bit more even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I am kind of thinking more and more to spend more time in London, uh, but you're most definitely invited. <laughs> and you. Um, and um, because there's a, this big festival here called No Exit, uh, oh, No Exit, my God, this is a Freudian slip. I did a festival <laughs> called No Exit at the ICA. <laughs> no, no, this is called Exit. And it was my festival was definitely uh, uh, an answer to, to um, the uh, Exit Festival, a small answer because it was a small festival and Exit is a huge music festival. Um, uh, so, yeah, so Exit is, is a good time to come here, but also not, not only. Um, and and I think you would you would be very interested and enjoy because there's quite a lot of things to see um, in the sense of um, things that are not widely known about the region, you know. Right. And I, I also I also think I'm thinking of going to to uh, Czechoslovakia um, maybe in the summer. So maybe, you know, maybe we can actually meet up <laughs> for a beer. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. In, in Prague. Yeah. Yeah, uh, why not? <laughs> I, I, was thinking, I was when you're thinking of it, okay, maybe Prague then. Yeah, so we definitely are going to uh, have a plan um to to meet up uh, right. out, uh, outside of the show, uh, but within the show, I would like to for you to tell uh, the listeners um where where they can find you, where they can find your work and what your plans are for the immediate future in terms of your work. All right. Oh, that's a nice uh, ending to the show. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I don't have any websites. It's never become my uh, my medium, really. So you just have to Google me. <laughs> and I, I do have um, uh, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm quite private about my Instagram. You really have to apply. Uh, but I think Facebook is open. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, Instagram really is, is my platform for sharing um, the developments in my work. And, and uh, uh, Facebook is a little bit more, you know, private, actually uh, show other stuff as well there. Is uh, your work on Academia? Um, Acad- uh, yeah, it's just my name uh, at uh, academia.edu. You can find mm-hmm. me there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, plans for the future. Um, it's a um, few, about two years ago, I started, this came out of the tarot uh, interest as well. I started reading um, uh, André Breton's um, Arcane uh, D set, Ar- Arcane uh, 17. Uh, it's about the star card. And it, it, it was written in the time that he was uh, a refugee in New York. And it was war and was the end of the war. And he's, he, uh, he tried to kind of think about a, f- a future for Europe. Uh, and he uh, wrote a little extension to one of the last uh, surrealist manifestos in which he says uh, mankind is in need of, of a new myth. Uh, so how can we create myths? And he, w- he was thinking uh, it should have uh, or it actually should be based 
on more uh, uh, feminine qualities. Uh, so from there, uh, I, I got really interested in um, in goddess uh, spirituality, uh, goddess religions. So the Osiris myth, of course, leading to the Isis, uh, you know, the history and the myths around Isis. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of researching that and uh, I hope some, some work um, will follow out of that. That's what I'm uh, hoping. Well, I can tell you that we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, oh, when right. we meet up for beer, yeah. <laughs> um, just especially, knew that. especially regarding the the, the goddess, um, the revival of the, of the goddess worship, because I'm very very interested in that too, and I'm quite um, engaged in it. Um, I I can I have to tell you that this was just a such such an, uh, a wonderful experience and such a joy. Uh, that uh, I'm sure that the listeners um, will have to um, in listening to um, the way you discuss your work. Um, and thank you so much for being a guest. And oh, for thank you for generous. inviting me. <laughs> thank, oh, oh, absolutely. Um, and um, for being so generous with your time and your knowledge. And um, please do come along again. Please. Yeah, let's let's <laughs> meet again and let's meet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, Milana. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Edward. Thank you. Thanks and goodbye.